Okay. Um, good morning, uh, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to our next uh, series of uh, lectures, guest lectures at UPC on deep and reinforcement learning. Today, we are very happy to have uh, Farhan Alet from MIT in Boston, who will provide uh, his lecture on meta learning, learning to leverage data at different time scales. So Farhan Alet is a PhD student at of, UPC, uh, sorry. On, he's a student at MIT, CISAIL, advised by Leslie Pack, Kaplan, and Thomas Lozano Peret, and meeting regularly with Josh Tenenbaum. His research focuses on machine learning, combinational generalization, and using insights from science and engineering to make machine learning models generalized more effectively. Before that, he studied mathematics and engineering physics at UPC Barcelona, Czech, so our university, being the political of CEFIS, our selective program that allows students to simultaneously complete two degrees. He completed his final degree thesis at MIT McKee by, with Professor Alberto Rodriguez, building the high-level planner of the MIT Prime Sprinson team that won the sewing task in the Amazon Robotic Challenge 2017. He has also competed in different scientific competitions, winning the Spanish Formatics Olympiad, the Catalan Physics Olympiad, and with teammates from UPC, two times the Southwestern European Regional of the ACM ICPC College Programming Competition. So you can uh, learn more about him on his website, alet-edol.com. So Farhan, thank you very much for your time, for waking up so early, it's 7 a.m. in Boston, so it's a great way to start the week. And so looking forward for your lecture on uh, Metro Learning. Awesome. Thanks, Xavier, for inviting me and for the uh, wonderful introduction. And yeah, it's a pleasure to be back to my uh, alma mater and I hope to uh, give back to it. Um, so let's let's get to it. So this is going to be an overview on meta learning. And in particular, I have two goals for this introduction. Uh, first is kind of uh, give you a brief overview of a few meta learning methods. So hopefully you'll learn something about this method. Uh, so most of the representative methods and then also a subset of uh, the research I'm most familiar with, so my own research. And then I would also like to kind of give an uh, overview so that if after the talk you want to know more about uh, meta learning, you can also learn more on your own. And so basically this uh, is kind of both a broad overview of the field um, from a, the perspective of uh, of kind of uh, meta learning as combining different time scales, and uh, and then kind of many pointers to different papers. So uh, the main motivation of uh, meta learning is kind of uh, combining creating priors from large amounts of data and uh, at at a big time scale and applying them at a shorter time scale where you have less amounts of data. We have seen. Uh, a big trend in uh, computer science and artificial intelligence towards more uh, compute, uh, substituting uh, automated uh, kind of manual, man manually designed pipelines. And meta learning is kind of the ultimate frontier in that regard, where uh, now uh, machines, um, machine learning is applied for machine learning itself and developing better machine learning algorithms. And so maybe the most uh, kind of uh, automatable in, in this paradigm is the auto ML paradigm, where kind of uh, the entire machine learning paradigm is put inside the inner loop. And then we try to just create better uh, machine learning algorithms themselves, either, for example, better architectures or better uh, machine learning algorithms or automatically designing uh, the hyperparameters of our um, machine learning algorithms. And you could Im imagine this is the equivalent of making uh, new learning machines entirely. So kind of the evolutionary time scale where uh, there is a lifetime of the agent and the agent lives it in, its, uh, in its own lifetime. And um, basically uh, it learns during its entire lifetime, but it's programmed by a set of genes. And these genes are also learned at the, at the time scale of evolution. And so uh, you could make this parallel between kind of auto ML and more like uh, evolutionary learning in, in, in the real world. But then, of course, there is uh, several other timescales that we could look into. So uh, we can try to learn uh, to do lifelong and continual learning, which are very important as we try to make machines that learn how to accumulate knowledge. And then uh, starting to get to more familiar topics for meta-learning, you could say, okay, uh, 
if I, if I have a collection of tasks, uh, either uh, learning tasks or optimization tasks, uh, can I learn uh, from a distribution of tasks to either learn or optimize them? Uh, so I can learn uh, to make new learning algorithms or make uh, new optimizers that are very uh, computer efficient, for example. This is especially useful uh, in future learning where we say, okay, maybe the tasks are actually pretty related, such as, for example, classifying uh, different uh, classes. Um, but I'm going to require that these um, machine learning algorithms are going to uh, require very few examples. So that's what's called future learning, either in supervised learning where you're given only a few examples of a given class or in reinforcement learning where you're given very limited uh, experience uh, in terms of um, the experience with the environment. And you want uh, to generalize from this as minor experience, but of course, then the task distribution is 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 kind of small. And you could imagine uh, these few experiences having a few minutes of experience. Kind of, this is intuitively speaking, of course. And then uh, this is kind of the most uh, explored paradigm in meta learning probably. And, but then you can still go down a bit. Uh, if you still consider uh, these, uh, bigger levels, making priors for lower levels, where you can try to adapt to distribution shift or domain uh, uh, or domain shift. Um, if you are prepared for it, you can uh, do a meta learning objective that builds priors that allow you to adapt, uh, for example, to changes in distribution, because, uh, for example, your input chains, like in this pandemic, where things state kind of uh, the real world was still the real world, but uh, many uh, inputs to machine learning are going to change drastically. Or, for example, if a robot uh, has some injury, uh, it, it kind of causes a, a, a small shift in the domain as well. And you have to be able to adapt. And then kind of the last uh, example is something that uh, I've been recently looking at, which is, can we use uh, meta learning for a uh, single task uh, for just a single task, the classic machine learning paradigm. But then in this case, each uh, task in the inner loop is just literally a single example. And so you, it's kind of uh, almost like an instant and learning to make prediction, basically. So uh, there's a, a wide variety of, of, um, of works in meta learning. It started probably in the late 80s, early 90s with Schmidhuber, Ben Benjo, and others. Um, that you can also have, you can also see in the classics um, list, and I would also recommend surveys uh, by Hospitales and uh, kind of the Stanford CS 330 if you're interested in more. Um, but basically, it's been growing in the last roughly uh, five years. And uh, if you want to come back to this uh, slide, I, I would recommend kind of all these paper series. But still, it's a very incomplete list. So what I will do is uh, now that I've given a kind of a, a, an overview, I'm going to give concrete examples um, for it to be more familiar. So I'm going to focus only on the ones that are in green. And hopefully this is going to provide uh, a good uh, intuition on, on how, uh, how meta learning works. So let's start um, by probably the most famous one, which is future learning. And in, in particular, in the sub case of supervised learning. So uh, you're probably all familiar with MNIST, where we have uh, examples uh, of 100 digits uh, from zero to nine. And in this case, therefore, we have 10 classes and we have 10,000 examples per class. This is great because, machine, uh, because uh, deep networks uh, really need the data. And therefore, uh, having 10,000 examples allows us to uh, be able to uh, kind of uh, classify MNIST digits very, very accurately. But of course, this is not how uh, humans learn, right? So humans, we only need one or very few examples uh, to learn a new class. However, we are able to uh, learn very, very efficiently. We don't need to learn kind of, we don't need to, to see 23 number eights before we understand what number eight is. But we, we, we can do this because we have seen lots of um, Hundred and digits, but a hundred and symbols in general, but also kind of a lot of visual experience in general. So, a um, uh, simplified domain that is, has been very popular uh, with good reason is kind of what's called MNIST transpose uh, informally, and kind of the name of the data set is Omniglot by Lee et al. And the intuition is that instead of having a very few classes and lots of examples per class, you have lots of classes and very few examples per class. So now, hopefully, you can learn some prior from other characters or other alphabets. 
the format's still the same. So you can see that it's still black and white, still uh, small images, but now there is a very, very big variety. And uh, again, you have to make methods now that they learn from very few examples. Um, another uh, data set based on uh, mini image net and kind of following the same format as, as Omniglot um, was also proposed, was proposed by Vignals et al. So uh, also from UPC, the, the first author, and also allows us to kind of explain the main meta learning setting in, in few shot learning. So let, let's go to it. So basically here we are given uh, an example of a class based on mini image net. Um, and the idea is if it's called five way one shot, the idea is that for example, in here we are given five classes per task. So we're going to have to distinguish um, between these five classes. So the dog, the, the lion, and kind of these other three objects. And uh, we're, this is also one shot because we're only now given one example per class. So in ImageNet, we are usually given, I think a thousand examples per class roughly, or uh, yes, a thousand examples per class. So now we have to learn much more efficiently than that. Um, and after seeing these five examples, one per class, we will have to uh, classify new examples. And that's why it's, we, we are in the few uh, short domain. Uh, so what we're going to have instead is having a, a training set of the tra of, of data sets. So its task will have a, its own training data set and its own test data set. Note that we can use uh, the test part of the meta training that's still kind of allowed uh, to be seen uh, for um, neural networks in, in meta learning. Usually we cannot optimize on the test set, but the test set of the meta training is still uh, kind of considered training. Then the meta learner at meta test time will observe a few uh, amounts of data for unseen classes on this, on this new task. And then we have to generalize to the meta test test. And that's the actual number we care about, the meta test uh, test. So the test part of the meta test tasks. So how would we go about uh, designing methods for this? So maybe the most uh, immediate that one that may come to mind is, hey, we have these neural networks and they are very, very general. So why don't we uh, just apply, uh, leverage leverage them to implement the learning algorithm? So why don't we teach them uh, to do the job of the learning algorithm? So what we're going to do is feed the entire data set as an input to the big neural network, and that hopefully learns as a representation and we use this to predict. Because the data set is not that large, we can feed the entire data set to the neural network. So for example, we can pick an LSTM and kind of feed the training examples, the small data set that we had seen before as examples uh, to the LSTM M. And the LSTM will keep some uh, hidden state and it will get modified as we give uh, the uh, kind of ice cream number one, dog number two, lion number three. It will keep getting modified. And then at the end, it will have some hidden state, phi i, it, the subscript i means it's kind of for task number i. Then you observe the test set, a new image, and then you have a classifier that's conditioned on this uh, hidden representation, in, and then you make the final prediction of this classifier that's conditioned by the training data set. So how are we going to train this? Well, actually, this looks a lot like regular machine learning, right? And that brings us to a common theme we'll see uh, in this, uh, introduction in this class, which is meta learning looks a lot like learning. Uh, you just have to keep in mind that uh, there is a different time scales involved. And so how do we train? Well, it's literally regular supervised learning. So what we're going to do is, is kind of simple. Basically, the only term that matters is the one on, on the bottom. You're going to maximize uh, the likelihood of the data. And so basically you train with respect to your parameters, uh, with respect to now you want to solve all the tasks, so you solve across tasks, and now you're going to say, hey, I want my uh, machine uh, that's conditioned on the training data set to perform well on the test data set. So of course you don't want it to perform well on the training data set, you want to perform well on the test set because it's very easy to learn to remember. You have to learn uh, to, uh, to generalize. So the pros is that uh, this is very easy to implement. This is kind of, uh, there is already uh, machines, uh, kind of easy amount of code to, to implement LSTMs or other 
supervised learning architectures that are not meta architectures. Um, but the cons is that it doesn't have the right inductive bias. No, nothing tells them that this that the LST, to the LSTM, hey, you should implement uh, a learning algorithm, and that makes them uh, less data efficient. So, for example, what is an inductive bias that we ha could have embedded to the algorithm, but we didn't? So, for example, the order in which we feed the examples really shouldn't matter. Uh, so we could have given the lion before the dog, but because we are building this into the LSTM, the LSTM has an order, and we uh, are not we, we are providing an order that really doesn't matter. So uh, in, in theory, we sh you should be invariant to the order, and there is smaller architectures that that can do that. Um, but it's kind of giving you already uh, a flavor of why this, this is not good. And the second thing is that if you think about it, the machine making the representations for all the images and the neural network implementing um, implementing the learning algorithm itself are kind of mixed. There is only read three, uh, one architecture with a set of weights doing both jobs, and that's a bit confusing. Let's switch to non-parametric methods, uh, and in particular, prototypical networks. So uh, they're kind of pretty intuitive for classification. Uh, so the intuition is we're going to use the examples themselves to help classification. And basically, we have to create a metric for nearest neighbors to be good. So what we're going to do is we pick our images, we embed them with a CNN, and now we average the embeddings for each uh, class separately. So we average all the embeddings for dog, we uh, average all the embeddings for lion, and we compute the centers for each class. And now when we want to classify uh, the new data point, uh, we do the soft mean of the distances. So basically, so that uh, we basically predict more the center that's closest to us. Uh, it's easy to implement and optimize, and it's very fast to compute but only works in classification, right? This, this paradigm uh, only works um, because we have a few images and it's only one of these classes that we care about. And if we had lots of examples, well, we'd still be taking averages of, of the examples we have, so it doesn't scale that well with uh, large numbers of examples. And then maybe the most popular framework for meta-learning uh, has been optimization-based meta-learning and MAML in particular. And so what's optimization-based meta-learning? Uh, meta so the idea is, hey, we already know some learning algorithms. Can we embed uh, the learning algorithms inside our neural networks? And probably the most uh, famous uh, learning algorithm is gradient descent, or uh, a few steps of gradient descent in particular. So can we use gradient descent fine-tuning and back-propagate through the fine-tuning? So what are we going to do? We have our training data set. And usually we would say, hey, we have a new task. Let's, let's do uh, create the send and optimize the network on this training data set. And after we do this training data set uh, adaptation, we have some now parameters phi i and we apply them to the test set and, and then we make the final prediction. So what MAML does is basically saying, I want my final network to perform well. And therefore, what do I control? The only thing I control is the initial parameters. So I'm going to learn parameters such that after applying gradient descent, I do well on the test set. So basically, uh, to kind of um, repeat it a bit, what we're going to do is say, OK, my algorithm consists of my pre-trained network. And then I will make one step of gradient descent, but it can be a few steps of gradient descent as well, on the training data. And that's going to give me my final parameters. And now, what is the meta loss? So how are we going to train this initialization theta? So our goal is to optimize sorry, uh, optimize these parameters theta. And the way we're going to do it is saying, hey, we have some parameters fine, and we know how these are computed by taking a gradient step with respect to the training data. And now we want these parameters that we obtain with the training data for task i to perform well on the test set for task i. And then we want to do well on all tasks, so we sum up the losses for each task. And as you can see, uh, again, similar to the black box uh, loss, we do the adaptation on the training data set, but we then evaluate it on the test set because we want machine learning, uh, kind of the, these meta learning networks to adapt and not just um, and not just memorize. And so we use the training data in the inner loop and the test for the outer loop. This has a useful inductive bias and generalizes very well. 
um, and works with any architecture. But optimization is very unstable because you have to take the gradient of a gradient. So when you optimize these logs, you will have to backprop through this gradient. And it's memory intensive because you have to keep everything in computation. These ideas can also work for few shot regression. So imagine you're given a few training data sets here, and you have to now generalize to this uh, sinusoid here, or you're given this one, you now have to generalize to this one. Uh, so we would have kind of, this is the meta training set of tasks, and now we are, you see a few points, and now you want to generalize to this uh, sinusoid. Uh, now, so in, in one of our works, we were interested on uh, whether we could make things that could generalize more broadly than just adapting a few parameters um, like MAML to different tasks. And so we said, okay, can we do uh, better by generalizing compositionally like, like human do uh, in terms of language, for example, where every sentence we create is novel by combining words that, and concepts that we already know, but we combine them in different ways and we generalize very broadly doing so. So in this case, if we knew a basis set of functions such that, for example, this function over here is the sum of these two functions. Now, when we see another function that may not look like anything else that we have seen before, now it's easy to generalize by combining these functions in different ways. Note that we have to learn both the basics and the structure. So we may know these functions because they're very popular in mathematics, as given an example, but we, in general, we will not know them. So we will have to learn both these basic sets of functions and the structures. So more concretely, MAML and other parametric meta-learning methods like the LSTM start with an untrained network. They see a collection of meta-training which with its own train and test. They have an adaptable network. And now at meta-test time, they adapt the network and do well on the test set. In modular meta-learning, we start with a few smaller neural networks untrained. And then when we train them, we train them to be composable. What does it mean to be composable? Basically, when you see a new test set, you can search how to compose your uh, small neural modules uh, and then generalize just by composing them. These two paradigms can be combined where you can train modules to be both composable and adaptable. So each network will be kind of a small mammal network. And now you can adapt both by combining them and back propagating and adapting their parameters as well small, uh, in a small way. So uh, how do we train this? So first, we have uh, this set of composable modules, and for each task, we have a different modular composition. And the way it's going to work is that um, modules in different tasks, they share parameters, and that's how we get this combinatorial generalization. So we have the same module acting in different tasks uh, in different parts of the networks. And so the key thing for training is that we can realize that since it's a composition of neural networks, the whole composition is differentiable, and therefore we can backpropagate each neural network um, by end-to-end -end gradient descent. And whenever a module appears in more than one task, we can pull the results, the, the gradients, and accumulate them. And then how do we train the compositions? Well, we can use a simple combinatorial algorithm such as simulated annealing, and where we make proposal changes, small changes, and variations to each architecture. We can delete modules, we can add modules, we can swap in modules, and that will kind of navigate the space, kind of trying to find uh, good architectures, a good composition of, uh, of modules. And so we, if you simultaneously optimize the parameters and the structures for each task in the meta training, then you will learn a good set of weights. And then at meta test time, you only have to search for the composition and you assume the weights are fixed. So in our examples of the functions, you're given these functions at meta, train, at meta training time, actually you only see kind of a sampling of these functions and you say, okay, what uh, is a good set of basis functions that allow me to generate all this variety of functions? And if we let the algorithm train, we start with these untrained modules on the left, but you can see that the modules start learning something, uh, start finding a common stru stru structure and figure out uh, a few uh, basis set of functions that allows them to to generate all the diversity in the meta training. And it discovers the step function, it discovers kind of uh, the sinusoid and the cosine, it discovers the absolute value all, in, all, in, all on its own in order to kind of be able to generate all the meta training. Of course, this is a uh, illustrative 1D example. We applied it to problems in robotics by kind of where the composition was inspired by a physics robotics model. And that allowed us to kind of discover in inherent structures. So for example, the modules depended on the objects 
uh, the, uh, in this case, we had to predict the motion of an object as pushed by a robot. And we found that, for example, all the ellipses, when we tried to predict the ellipses, the modular composition used uh, kind of the same modules and same for the triangles. Uh, the modular compositions of the triangles were closer than triangles versus rectangles. And uh, also, similarly, for predicting motions of humans when doing different actions, in this case, the composition was uh, a module predicting each limb. And so the intuition is that uh, different actions uh, that were very close, such as jumping in the same place and doing jumping jacks, had a lot uh, of the same modules applied. Whereas, for example, I don't know, uh, waving one hand and punching maybe had very little re resemblance. Okay, so we have uh, given an overview of few shot learning in supervised learning. So now, uh, what we're going to do is basically reuse this technique of modular meta learning. The same technique, we're going to see how it applies kind of one level down in this time scale hierarchy. And this is joint work with Erica Wang, who was a master's student with me at MIT, and now she's a PhD student at, uh, at CMU. And we're going to see how we're going to apply it to a problem that usually wouldn't think of as meta learning, which is inference. So uh, I believe you've seen some in, in past classes, some work on graph neural networks. Uh, so this is uh, a very interesting work done by Kip and Welling, which is called a neural relational inference. And the idea is you have, you see a few uh, particles interact or a few entities interact in general, and you have to predict the future. Imagine, for example, these are charged particles. You don't know which ones are positive, which ones are negative, which ones are attracting, which ones are repelling. In order for you to predict the future, you have to first infer the graph of relations, which particle is which type and which uh, relation is each type. And now once you have these uh, types uh, of relations, now you say, okay, now that I know which particles adapt, uh, attract and which ones repel, now I just have to run the corresponding graph neural network customized to my set of particles. So you have to infer the relations and then execute them. This doesn't look like a kind of meta learning setting because it's kind of just one prediction task. But you can think of using the modular meta learning framework where now each task is a different scene and different time steps of that scene are different examples of one task. And whereas before in modular meta learning, all the modules had kind of the same architecture, now uh, this paradigm uses node neural networks, a few, a collection of node neural networks and a collection of edge neural networks in order to generalize. And so basically now when we see a new scene, we, we look for the best node neural networks and edge neural networks uh, composition in order to uh, make the final predictions. And you can see how we are reusing the same ideas uh, for now things that apparently wasn't uh, multiple tasks. If you think it from the lens of um, just building priors from um, having observed many different scenes, now I can learn to do inference very well using the same techniques. Cool. Now let's move on to a uh, few shot reinforcement learning. We will see that some of the methods that we analyze for the supervised learning portion are also apply, uh, applicable for reinforcement learning with a few changes. So the first one uh, is actually very similar to black box adaptation, which is saying, hey, let's just give it to a recurrent neural network and let the recurring neural network just do its job and learn the, the entire learning algorithm. So what we do is we say, okay, we just have a recurring neural network uh, that's going to execute the entire, the entire lifetime. And by doing so, uh, we do not reset the hidden state between episodes. And that's very key because now, uh, if uh, when we reset the, the hidden state between episodes, we are not allowed to remember from past episodes, but we want the network to kind of learn from past episodes and therefore by not resetting be between episodes, that's when we are allowed to generalize. So imagine, for example, you're these mice and you don't know where your foot is. Uh, so you would like to first explore and then remember the, uh, where, you, where you found the foot. So for example, the first time step you go right, you didn't find foot, so you get a reward of zero. You go back, you get a reward of zero. Now you go up zero and then right one. And so let's say the episode finishes. Well, next time you're not going to go right first because you remember now that your uh, that your foot was on the top right. Now, next time you do it, you go up and right and you don't need to uh, re-explore any, anymore. 
And this is very simple because it's just, uh, again, a recurrent neural network policy where you don't reset. Cool. Um, the other approach that also transfers from uh, few shot supervised learning is MAML and similar methods. Um, so another type of, of thing that you can do in, in MetaRL is having uh, these uh, legged robots in simulation, these Mujoko robots, and make a task where each task is kind of going to different locations in the map. And so uh, you're going to train an agent so that after adaptation, it learns to go to the correct position in the map. Uh, so you have to change a bit uh, how you compute the inner gradients, but the idea is still the same. I'm going to learn an initialization of parameters so that I quickly adapt my parameters to doing different tasks. Notice that, um, that that's cool and it, it kind of that almost doesn't change the framework of MAML, but it has a bit of trouble because MAML per se does not learn an exploration policy. And so if you want to have this consistent exploration policy with MAML, you have to do quite a bit of work that, that I will not go um, on, on this introduction. You can find more work in the related uh, work slide I, I did at the beginning. So um, we were kind of motivated by the lack of generality of, of this RL method. So if you if you saw the examples I gave, these were mostly robots going to different places. So for example, a robot generalizing to uh, going to the right or learning going to the left, this almost felt like to us that, like this was the same task, just minor variations of the same task. And kind of maybe the in 2019 when we started our work uh, that I will present now, the most uh, uh, meta learning algorithm could generalize is being trained on going to different locations on the to the right. And then I'm at the test time learning to go to the left, which, okay, it's a bit of generalization out of the distribution, but still kind of limited. So our goal was, hey, can we train, can we learn algorithms that are very general uh, in the sense that they apply to completely different domains? So we took different open AI gym domains and we would like to learn on some domains and apply it to other domains. Uh, so we did this work in uh, 2019. There's also some concurrent work that took a different approach, but with similar goals by Kirch and all. Uh, so this is joint work with Martin Schneider that uh, was um, a, a master student I was mentoring at MIT and he stayed uh, uh, luckily with us uh, as a PhD student now. Uh, the best way to analyze the method I'm going to talk about now is at the evolutionary time scale. We will see that we're kind of now we're going to find the code or the genome of the uh, of the agents, and now the agents will uh, start completely from scratch uh, in order to uh, and then learn uh, the entire <coughs> learn all the uh, reinforcement learning loop. So the way you have to think about it now is where the inner loop of this meta learning is going to be the entire lifetime of the agent. Um, and the code now feels like a lot like machine learning algorithms. Um, we, we will make a machine that searches for machine learning algorithms. Now our inspiration is that machine learning algorithms are able to work in very varied domains like GANs or transform transformers, the same idea with some um, changes in the architecture is able to generalize to very different domains. So if we search at the level of algorithms of, of literal pieces of code, maybe we can generalize very broadly. So uh, in particular, we were focused on uh, inventing new curiosity algorithms and formulating this as a meta-learning problem. So imagine you have an RL agent in reinforcement learning interacting with some environment, and usually we'll have an RL algorithm like PPO, someone, a human invented this cool algorithm and it has a machine with its own neural networks inside. So it has a piece of code that tells the neural networks how to learn and how to act. This machine outputs actions to the environment and the environment provides states and rewards back to the algorithm. The algorithm will use them to update the networks. And then what we do is we have a curiosity learning that's meta-learned and then provides proxy rewards. And we want to invent this algorithm. So many people have invented cool algorithms. Can we make a computer that invents the algorithms for itself? So we got inspired and we looked at the previous literature and kind of made a language of curiosity algorithms. I will not go into detail, but basically these uh, algorithms have neural networks inside that make computations. You can combine results from different neural networks 
an output uh, a reward for the overall array legend. And crucially, you have to make the algorithm learn how to learn. So we were also going to search how to train this, this curiosity algorithm by backpropagation. And so the idea is we train on this simple uh, domain with fixed discrete actions and few time steps, but want to generalize to continuous action spaces and a lot of time steps, so 500,000 time steps of training. We tried basically automatically, you can search over uh, short programs, short algorithms, and we can see that most of the programs do pretty badly, but there is a few, uh, so this is the mean performance, sorry, uh, sorted by performance and plus standard deviation and minus the standard deviation on different lifetimes of the agent. And you can see that there's a few programs that are statistically significant that are very good. Um, so most of them are random, a few are good. And we are, if we analyze the top programs, you can see that still when we are still in this random region there and the kind of sort of good programs in this simple domain are only sort of, are kind of bad on the, on the new domain, but on the very, very best on the right for this simple environment are also good on the new environment and same for this. So if you're on the very right, you're on the top right and not, you can, when, when you're in the left, you can be anywhere, but when you're in statistically significant, you're also good on the, on the new program. And this is for comparison is the human designed algorithm. So they do good, but not that good. Um, and uh, we also evaluated these uh, algorithms found in the, in a simple task, also Mojoko, which look very different. And they were also comparable to human algorithms. Not only that, the cool thing was that it invented novel algorithms. So literally pieces of algorithms that one could publish in a machine learning conference. Uh, the top two algorithms uh, were both a novel and hadn't been proposed in the curiosity literature before. The first one was uh, kind of simple, basically saying, oh, you have to move fast in a neural network embedding of the action, a neural network predicting the action, and you have to move fast in that space. The second one was even crazier uh, in the sense that it took us two months to figure it out, um, what it was doing. But once we figured it out, we understood it was reinventing an idea from the gun literature. It never proposed for curiosity by making a network that predicted the future, another that predicted the past and saying, if you predict the future and from the future, you predict the past and you don't predict the present, that means you don't understand the current state very well. And that's good because that means you're going to a novel state. And that's kind of the intuition of what it figured out. So finally, let's make uh, kind of the, we went to one extreme, the evolutionary time scale. Let's go to the other extreme to kind of finalize our overview and go to the single example prediction. And that's kind of very novel work that I'm pretty excited about. And this is joint work with Kenji Kawaguchi, Maria Bauza, who's also from UPC and now a PhD at MIT and a neural agriculture. Um, so our work is kind of called uh, tailoring and is a way of embedding in inductive biases using meta-learning. So uh, in this case, we're going to use meta-learning with unsupervised losses for a single task. So it's a classical machine learning setting where we have training and test set, um, but we can still leverage meta-learning. So it's a new way of encoding inductive biases with theoretical guarantees. And because it's the classic machine learning paradigm, we have many applications. I'm only going to talk about the physics time series prediction to provide you an intuition, but we also have applications on contrastive learning, adversarial examples, and even model-based reinforcement learning. And we had to implement, because now we are lever uh, kind of applying it to one task, uh, the statistics on how it works is basically that each example on that task, each prediction on that task is going to be a different task in the meta-learning sense. So it's, they are super, super small uh, tasks. And to make this all efficient, the regular meta-learning algorithms uh, don't work. We can go over this in the question time if you have uh, more interest. But the, intu in the intuition is that you have to build a new meta-learning algorithm um, for to make this idea efficient. So basically, what was our goal? Imagine you want to make predictions for a uh, uh, planets, uh, planetary systems. And in machine learning, in general, one would like to encode inductive biases. So for example, CNNs are a good inductive bias encoding translation, graph neural networks encode permutation invariance. And every time we use inductive biases, we're able to chunk out a bit of uh, performance um, by encoding something about the world. And there's even theorems in machine learning that say, if you don't include these inductive biases, there's no chance of, of generalizing. Um, in general, you're going to get uh, no free lunch, basically. So imagine in the planetary system, we want 
to encode the fact that we know the energy and momentum in physics are conserved. So whatever predictions the network makes about where the planets are going to move next, it's going to have to conserve energy and momentum. So the better kind of how we would go about it uh, usually is okay, we would say, okay, I want to make a NURIPS paper about, about this idea. So, okay, let me have an idea. Let me think for a while, how can I make a neural network that encodes energy and momentum conservation? So you would think for a while, uh, you would get a, a very nice idea on how to encode it. Now you would build your new um, neural network pipeline. Of course, you would get kind of lots of, of PyTorch errors building this novel architecture. And after a lot of, uh, of, of work and very good ideas, you would build your, your paper uh, on, on this idea that conserved energy, but does not conserve momentum. So now you have to go back and do a lot of work on thinking uh, for new ideas and, and uh, basically coding some more. So can we make this, this pipeline better, simpler, basically? So the idea is we can say, okay, we can have auxiliary losses that say, not only uh, do I want to make good predictions, do I want my predictions to match the target with MSE loss, but I'm going to add some aux auxiliary loss that says I want energy conservation and I want momentum conservation. But that's an issue because you have a generalization gap uh, in terms of uh, predictions and that we already know basically the training is it goes down, but the test eventually goes up. And that's kind of what we want to minimize. Um, but we now also have a, a generalization gap for the physics loss, right? Because we optimize this for the training data set, but we do not, we're not able to optimize this for the test set. So we, you're also going to get a generalization gap for the physics loss. And so that's, that's not good because you're not going to generalize to this energy conservation and momentum conservation that's not going to be satisfied at test time. And so that's not an inductive bias. However, we can notice that here we only need the input and the prediction. We don't need the target to compute energy conservation because you only say the energy of my prediction has to match the energy of my input. So you can say, oh, I can optimize this, uh, this unsupervised loss at prediction time. And now that you optimize it also for the test set, well, now, now everything is good because now you don't have the generalization gap for the physics loss and that allows you to learn better um, in, in, your, in your ultimate task. But actually, uh, the good thing to do is if you are optimizing it at test time, you have to optimize it at training time. So you, we built a meta-learning algorithm that learns to optimize this for every example at, meta, at, at training time and then learns to also uh, generalize well when applying this unsupervised objective at test time. Finally, my last slide is kind of where are we going next? Personally, I, I, I have a clear direction on kind of making meta learning that generalizes more broadly. And uh, that's also a, a direction I think the current field is lacking. So we have seen a meta learning um, on in particular fusion learning data sets that are very big in terms of number of classes, lots of like, like a thousand classes, and also kind of naturalistic in the sense that they use real images. And that's very good. But um, the field has seen that uh, the exemplars are kind of similar in the sense that you can learn a neural network. Um, you can uh, you don't need that much information. So usually you only need one exemplar you, uh, of a doc in order to represent the class doc. And that, that's already pretty simple. And the tasks are pretty close. So it has also been shown on the future learning uh, literature that you can do very well by just learning a neural network that does all the tasks. Uh, and kind of only fine tune uh, a bit the parameters on the last layer and reusing most of the features. So basically these tasks are not challenging enough yet. On the other hand, uh, I'm very inspired by the program synthesis community that asks programs to find programs. Basically you have to find programs that satisfy uh, some data sets. And these programs generalize very broadly out to things that do not look, uh, do, do look very different from each other and can extrapolate to a very big execution. So from small towers, you can build large towers or from uh, small physics laws, you can combine them to make more complex physics laws. Uh, so they require very broad generalization, but usually these data sets are small and manually created. And uh, because they're manually created, they're usually um, sort of the same difficulty and do not allow you to scale to very difficult problems. So we're building a new uh, data set right now. It's presented at NeurIPS workshops, which kind of combines the best of both worlds. Uh, it's large and naturalistic and requires in, uh, extrapolation to a diff in all different kinds. Uh, so uh, this is joint, joint work with uh, an undergrad 
currently at UPC, Javier Lopez Contreras. And the intuition of what we're doing is basically we pick uh, codes from programming competition. Uh, there's lots of humans submitting uh, codes solving these tasks. These tasks are super hard for current machine learning algorithms, but maybe we, what we can do is extract subcodes and make tasks out of these subcodes. And we can scale from very short, simple subcodes to larger subcodes and eventually make uh, machines that learn how to program uh, and therefore also influence the world uh, through coding as well and generalize very broadly because now they generalize to uh, tasks with different number of inputs and also are able to extrapolate from shorter and simpler test cases with small uh, arrays and small numbers to larger arrays and, and numbers and generalize very broadly. And so I think that's an, an exciting direction for future work. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I hope uh, that gave you some excitement about the current meta learning research. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Farhan. It's impressive the amount of work that you have covered in such a short time. I really appreciate and thank you for the effort of synthesis and also impressive the work you are doing at MIT. And so for our viewers uh, from outside UPC, we'll finish now the streaming. Uh, next week, we have another talk by uh, Ignacy Clavera from Berkeley. And on the other hand, Farhan, I invite you to join our class on the other room to uh, address Q&A. OK, thank you very much.